Okay, hello and welcome to lecture 4 of the 7 part HGBind lecture series on conducting DEVOS studies. Today's lecture will focus on the importance of doing really good quality control of one's data before going in to do an actual GWAS testing and we'll provide specific examples of what to control for. So some quick house rules before we commence. Please keep your microphones on mute to prevent any background noise from interfering with the lecture. Uh, if one would like to ask any questions, please click on the person icon on the top ribbon and choose the raise hand option. Questions can be typed in after lecture and the lecturer will address those questions. When the talk ends, the meeting room will be closed and automatically redirect you to an attendance form. Please select the clerk lecture and register your attendance. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure that today I introduce today's lecturer, um, Sean Aaron, who is currently a bioinformatics consultant and lecturer at the Sydney Brenner Institute for Molecular Biosciences at the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. After pursuing an honours degree in human genetics, Sean handed over the pipettes to experts that entered the emerging field of bioinformatics, pursuing an MSc degree developing skills in a wide array of bioinformatics domains. Sean is currently a member of the HG Biomet uh, Pan-African Genetics Network, and he's the co-chair for the HG Biomet Training and Education Work Package, and he's also the co-organizer of the HG Biomet GWAS Lecture Series and upcoming practical workshop. Uh, Banjo, if you please like to put your microphone on mute because we're getting a lot of interference from your microphone. Thank you, Razak. Um, so, Sean is currently the co organizer of the Issue Binet GWAS Lecture Series and the upcoming practical workshop. Sean's research interests include GWAS and complex diseases in African populations, exploring population diversity, structure, and admixture in Africa and he's very passionate about bioinformatics education and training and has been involved in providing numerous high quality bioinformatics workshops within South Africa and around Africa. So without further ado, short of the team. Thanks, Samir. So hopefully everyone can hear me. Just do a quick uh, test, everyone can hear me. Yeah, okay, that one yes, that's, that's good enough. Uh, okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks, Sumir. Um, so, welcome to this uh, this uh, edition of the uh, GWAS uh, lecture series. Um, and today we're going to be having a look in particular at some GWAS QC, or quality control. Uh, this lecture is a bit information heavy, so I'm actually going to go through quite a bit. Well, so I'll go through some of the, the slides and I'll stop at some point maybe address questions at that point. But as Samir said, as I'm going through the lecture and you have any questions, I think it's probably best if you try and type it into the chat. Uh, okay, so uh, before we get going on QC, let's just have a quick recap. Because uh, the lectures take place over a long period of time, people sort of tend to forget. So just to, to recap sort of in terms of data generation, uh, in terms of a GWAS, so when we start off, we have some disease of interest that we look at, we go out and collect samples. Uh, we then extract DNA from these samples. Uh, we prep them and we run them on a chip. We then uh, scan those chips and uh, eventually we get out uh, a bunch of intensity reads for each of our samples. And uh, in the lecture earlier on this week that Aiton gave, we spoke about how we then convert those intensity values into some sort of genotype call for each of our individuals. Um, and then once we've got once we've got to that step, so then we have basically we have a data set which tells us what is our genotype call for each of our individuals for a particular SNP. We then take that data and we do a lot of mining and manipulating and quality control, and hopefully at the end of the day we come out with with an association test uh, that gives us some interesting results back. Uh, but an important, a very important aspect that you have to do quite carefully and quite accurately before you or even think about getting any accurate results in terms of your association testing is the quality control. So before I jump into that, uh, I want to just spend a couple of minutes talking about Plink format. So uh, after the last lecture where we did, where we had some explanation on how we go from uh, getting genotype calls off the, off the actual uh, 
from the actual arrays. Uh, and at the end of that, we end up in we end up with data. So Pling format is a very common format that's used in GWAS studies, uh, and essentially, in its in its in its in its most compressed form, it consists of three main files. So there's a FAM file, which basically contains one row of information per individual. There's a BIM file, which contains one row of in, one row of information for a particular SNP. And then there's a BED file. So the BED file is actually contains one row of information per individual. And this is actually containing the genotype for each individual. So this is the important file. So this tells us what is the genotype for a particular individual. But the the the, the format that is in currently in, in in its most compressed version is actually a format that's not human readable. So we're able to open the FAM file and have a, and look, have a look at it. We're able to open the BIM file and have a look at it. But the BED file uh, in this compressed version uh, is not human readable. Um, and this is just an, an efficient way in which we can store information for many samples for millions of SNPs. So if we look at what these files actually look like, so on the top uh, in the slide, I'm showing you the FAM file. So what we have is, in the first column, we have something called a family ID, and then we have an individual ID. Don't worry too much about the family ID. Uh, uh, Plink data can be used for doing family-based studies. So if you are doing family-based studies, the family ID is important. But the individual ID is the unique identifier for the particular individual. Again, we have something called a paternal ID and maternal ID. Again, this is useful for family studies. We then have a column that says sex. So this is coded as uh, one or two, uh, or zero if missing. And then we have a column for phenotype. So this column is then used to code whether your sample is a case or control. So it would be control. Uh, if it's coded as one, it would be control. Uh, if it's coded as two, it will be case. In most instances, if that information is missing, it will be zero. Okay. So the FAM file contains information about our samples. Uh, in the BIM file, we now have information about our SNPs. So we have the first column, chromosome, what chromosome that SNP is on. We have a particular ID. So that can be an RS ID, can be various different IDs. In this case, uh, the ID is a chromosome, colon, and the position. Uh, we then have uh, another column, which could be genetic distance. So this information would be obtained from a recombination map for for your particular uh, population of interest, if you if you do have that. Uh, you then have base pair position. So this is the actual base pair in the genome for that particular particular SNP. And then you have the two alleles for that particular SNP. So for for example, our first SNP here can either be a C or a T. Okay. And so this the BOOM file just can, contains information about the individual SNPs. The actual genotypes and then contained in in the bed file, okay? And I'm not showing you the bed file because, like I said, the bed file is not human readable, okay? So just to put into context, that's the sort of file, that, that, those, that is a set of files that we start off with when we run our QC, okay? So going back to quality control. So why do we need to do quality control? So essentially, in an ideal world, we'd be able to do everything perfectly. So our sample practices would be perfect. Our experiments would run perfectly without any problems. Uh, and all our SNPs, or all our SNP genotypes would look something like, like the diagram that you're seeing here. So for this particular SNP, we can clearly, we get clear signals for a homozygous. For this particular SNP, uh, we get clear deline delineation between homozygous for uh, the reference allele, homozygous for the alternative allele, and some heterozygous SNPs. Um, so ideally, if everything worked out perfectly, all our all our SNPs would be genotyped and look like this. Unfortunately, uh, we don't live in an ideal world, and so there are various different uh, there are various different steps where errors can actually uh, creep into our data. And in general, when you're doing very large scale experiments, uh, there's a there is a, an error rate that is associated with any results that you get out. So we have to be aware that this error rate exists and that there are possible errors in our data. And that's why we run this very stringent QC in order to try and eliminate any SNPs or individuals that actually could be could be you know could be errors in our data and not give us a real signal so that we don't go all the way to the end of the association and then find out that we have an association but this SNP is actually 
uh, not a really a, a really well a genotype SNP. So in terms of where these errors might originate, there's various different steps in the process where we can get these errors happening. So the first is sample selection related issues. So this is when you're actually selecting a sample. You might have uh, some relatedness in your data. And we're going to come back to each of these aspects and explain in a bit more detail. You might have some population structure in your data. In terms of sample handling related issues, uh, there might have been something that went wrong when you were actually labeling your samples or plating your samples. There might have been some mix up. Uh, you can have genotype array related issues. So like I said before, any large scale uh, experiment would have some sort of level of error associated with the results that you get out. And then you can also have batch effect related issues. So if you are processing your samples uh, in different batches, so say you send off ten, uh, a thousand samples, they, they genotype it on an array, and then you send another thousand samples, and they genotype it in a different batch, there could be differences in the way that these samples are handled, which could lead to differences in the results that you get back. So ideally, ideally, one way of doing quality control is, is being able to look at each one of those genotype plots and try to see if the SNP has been genotyped accurately. Now, obviously, this is not practical when you're looking at 2.5 million SNPs or 5 million SNPs. So what we do is we, we've tried, or well, not me, but people in the field have tried to develop some, some clever ways in which we can try and use particular proxies or particular measurements to try and determine whether a SNP is likely to be of bad quality or not, or whether a sample is likely to be have been genotyped badly or not. Okay, so we have these what I call proxies or metrics that allow us to assess uh, whether we have good quality data or not. So in terms of the way that I'm going to go about this, uh, I'm going to do the steps, uh, break it up into quality control by SNP and by sample. Uh, so let's see the next slide, but I'll come back to that a little bit later. So, 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 so ideally, like I said, I showed you that the first slide, which is this one here. Um, you know, ideally, if we lived in a great, if, we, uh, if everything worked out perfectly, we would have all our SNPs uh, set look, sets looking like that. But in reality, we have a combination of all these different types of genotyping uh, 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 SNPs being genotyped like this happening in our data. So it's all not very clear and very accurate, and not all SNPs are genotyped uh, to the same quality in the same way. So that is why we try to use quality control to try and weed out these SNPs that could possibly that are you that were likely to be genotyped badly and behave badly in our experiments, so that we end up with a good quality, clean data set when we do our association testing. So this is just giving you a practical example. So this was an actual study that was done on, on, on heart, attack, uh, uh, heart attacks in families. Um, and essentially, they took their original data set. They just genotyped everything. Uh, it was a 500,000 uh, SNP array. And they just didn't do any QC, and they ran uh, association testing. And what you can see is, uh, for those of you who know a little bit about your association testing results in Manhattan plots, uh, the black line here is what they considered significant, and you could see that they had the significance across their entire data set. Um, and, and what they realized in the end is this, this, is, this was really just due to noise and the fact that they hadn't cleaned up their data set properly. Because once they ran through QC, they started off with 5 million SNPs, they ran through QC, they ended up with 270,000 SNPs. And what happened was none of those SNPs actually reached genome-wide significance uh, when they had actually cleaned up the data properly. So you can see that uh, running your QC accurate or running accurate QC on your data can have a major downstream or it can have a major effect on uh, the association signals that you you pick up downstream. Okay, so so the QC is essentially, I mean, it, it it it's kind of there's various different steps that you follow in the QC uh, process, uh, and there have been different ways that people have gone about this. Uh, for the sake of simplicity for this lecture, I split the QC into sample QC and SNP QC. Um, but the way that I'm, the order that I'm giving it to you in the lecture is not always the best way to do the QC. And what we've actually done in the HA Binet pipeline is we've actually tried to develop the best order, well, generalized order, for doing the QC. So it's not done in exactly the same way that I'm talking to you about it today. 
uh, but it is the most, what we think is the most optimized way of doing it. So in terms of sample QC, uh, we this is now looking at samples and trying to identify samples that could have been badly genotyped or there could be some problem with these samples. We look at discordant sex information. We look at missingness. We look at uh, heterozygosity. We try to identify duplicate or related individuals. We identify divergent ancestry, and we try to look at batch effects. Okay. In terms of SNP QC, we look at minor allele frequency. We look at missingness. We look at differential missingness between cases and controls. And we look at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium outliers. So I'm going to unpack each of these. And the reason I'm unpacking it is, especially for those who are attending the, the hands-on workshop, you're going to be using a pipeline, right? And essentially what we've done is we've taken all these steps and we've put it into a pipeline. Uh, so, so you are not going to see necessarily be able to see the background workings of what's happening at each step. So that's why this lecture is important. I'm going to break that down for you at each step in what we're doing so you can understand understand it. So in terms of the programs that we use for QC, um, in, in, in our experience, uh, and uh, essentially a, a large majority of people who do, do GWAS uh, generally use Plink. So Plink has all the functionality to do most of the, most of the QC steps. Uh, we then have some scripts that we've developed in order to process some of the result files. Uh, we then make use of R to do some plotting. Um, and then, like I said before, we've actually put all these steps into a nice little uh, workflow uh, using NextFlow, and that's the pipeline that you'll be using at the workshop. Okay. So let's start off with sample QC. So essentially what we're doing here is we're trying to identify and remove individuals <coughs> based on these various different uh, components. Uh, and the first one that we look at is discordant sex information. So whenever you're collecting samples uh, for, for your GWAS, in all instances, you're going to collect sex information. So when you collect your, or you send out your questionnaire, and the questionnaire is going to be, are you male or female? OK. And that information is going to be stored. And like I said, when I showed you the Plink files, that information is then stored in the FAM file. OK. So what we're doing now with this, with this first QC step is we're saying, Using the genetic information now, so the SNPs on the X chromosome, can we call the the sex of our individuals? Okay, and then does that sex of that we call from the G, from the genotype match the sex that we collected when we collected the sample? Okay, and again, this can be used. There might have been like sample mix-ups or, or plating errors if you pick up a large discrepancy in sex uh, in your data set. So how does it work? Uh, so males have a single X chromosome, and therefore if we estimate the homozygosity for all the X chromosome SNPs, uh, we expect that males will be homozygous, right? So we calculate something called an XHE, which is X chromosome homozygosity. And if XHE is close to 1, then we know that that sample is a male based on the genotype, OK? So uh, if the XHE is, uh, well, well, there is some level of error and some level of differences uh, depending on how many SNPs you genotype on the X chromosome. So basically we say if XHE is greater than 0 0.8, then we would call that sample or that individual a male. If XHE is less than 0 0.2, okay, so then again, based on the homozygosity, we expect that the females would be less homozygous than the males. If XHE is less than 0 0.2, then we call those female samples. And if it's anywhere in between, we would say that it's, we can't actually call the sex for that particular sample. Okay. And then what we do is we compare what we call from the genotype and what we collected from the FAM file from when we collected the sample. And we try to see if there were any mistakes or differences. So this is how you actually run it. So I'm showing you, so, so, so this is just extra information. So if you're running it on your own, not within the pipeline, um, you'd run plink. Minus minus b file is the name of our, of our files that we started off with. So for example, we would have example.fam, example.bim, and example.bed. 
we use this flag called minus minus check six. And then what that does is it then does this calculation for you. And it says it then evaluates the results. So uh, this, I'm trying not to erase erases when you go past it. Okay, so so for for individual one, okay, P five five four, the ped sex is the sex that we collected when we collected the sample. Okay, the SNP sex is what we got for the sex when we actually looked at the genotype and calculated the XHE. Okay. When those two match, so for example two and two, okay, it says status okay because the PED, the what we collected and what we calculated from genotype uh, is fine. Okay. When they don't match, right, it's gonna say problem. So it's gonna say when we calculated the text from the genotype, it was different from what it, uh, what that sample was labeled as when we collected the sample. Therefore, that's a problem. Okay. And so this, like I said, this can be a problem with sample collection. It can be a problem with, with sample mix-ups. So essentially, when you have this problem, you go back to the person who collected the samples and try, try and resolve this. Uh, and if you don't, and it's a small number of individuals, then in most cases, you would then just remove those individuals. Okay, so like I said, this is now built into to Nextflow, so you, you're not going to be actually physically running those Plink commands. You're actually going to be setting up the pipeline, and what I've put here is the parameters that go into the pipeline. So these are the parameters that are linked to the sex check QC that you do. So the first one is sex underscore info underscore available equals true. So this is, in most cases, this is always true, so where you have sex information in your FAM file. Okay, that means that you've collected the sex information. The F underscore low underscore male is your XHE threshold for male. And F underscore high underscore female is your XHE threshold for calling a female. Okay, so those are the parameters that you can set when you're running the, the next flow pipeline for running QC. Okay, so the next step in uh, sample QC is missingness and heterozygosity. So essentially, uh, missingness is where uh, we are unable, where, or well, where the software is essentially unable to call a genotype for a particular SNP. And essentially what happens is that, you know, that for that particular SNP, uh, it will be called as, as missing data. So for example here, where we, we have a bit of you know, not so great clustering, uh, you'll see the dots in black uh, are dots where it's most likely those particular SNPs that particular SNP in, in, in this, this SNP in those particular individuals will actually be coded as missing. Okay, so in those individuals, those particular those black dots there, we won't have a genotype called for this particular SNP just because the software isn't able to differentiate whether it is homozygous, heterozygous, or homozygous for the alternative allele. Okay, so in terms of missingness, we have per sample missingness. So this is the percentage of SNPs with missing data per sample. And then we also have per SNP missingness. So the percentage of missingness of missing calls for a particular SNP. So those are two different things. And we'll deal with them uh, separately. So per sample missingness is what we'll deal with first. Uh, but generally what we try to do is we try to look at missingness and heterozygosity together. Okay. So the reason for this is that we in most instances, you might find that these these two metrics can affect each other. So if there's a high percentage of missingness, you might essentially also have uh, an effect on the heterozygosity that you're observing. So this is why I try to look at them together. So the missingness of the, is, is basically the genotype call rate. So it's per sample or individual rate. And your genotyping call rate is the number of non-missing genotypes divided by the total number of genotype markers, OK? And essentially, if you have a sample where a lot of SNPs have not been genotyped, it's an indication that there might have been something wrong with that sample. There might have been uh, low DNA concentration or something went wrong with that sample preparation. And generally, the thresholds that we use, you say, if a sample has anywhere between 3 and 7% or greater than 3 or 7% missingness, then we say, OK, well, it's likely that that sample was not genotyped properly. We'll exclude it. Okay. Uh, in a similar way, we can look at heterozygosity rate. So again, this is per individual. 
And again, that's just the way that we work it out. So the number, so the heterozygosity rate is the number of total non-missing genotypes minus the homozygous genotypes divided by the total number of missing genotypes. And again, if we have an individual who has excess heterozygosity, there's a possibility that you could have, have sample contamination. So you could have mixture, we could have a mixture of multiple samples. And if you have less than expected heterozygosity, it's possible that you could have inbreeding. Okay, so you could have in, you could have a large proportion of related individuals in your data set. Uh, and the threshold we use for heterozygosity is essentially we remove uh, any individual with plus minus three standard deviations from the mean heterozygosity rate for all the samples together. Okay, uh, and and I'm going to come back to this plot uh, uh, and show you it in the in the in the next couple of slides. But essentially, what we do is we run this analysis in Plink. We get the results out. And then we plot the heterozygosity rate and the genotype call rate together. And then we try and look at cutoffs and choose cutoffs based on that in order to uh, in order to maximize the number of samples that we're able to retain. OK. So quickly, just to go through it, uh, if you're running this in Plink, uh, we say Plink minus minus B file example. This is our data set. We use a flag called minus minus missing. OK. Now, this is going to calculate two things for us. It's going to calculate our per individual missingness, okay, which is up here, uh, and then it's also going to calculate our per SNP missingness. So remember, I told you we're looking at there's two different types of missingness: there's per individual missingness and there's per SNP missingness. For now, I'm going to talk about the per individual missingness, and we'll come back later to the per SNP missingness. So essentially, this just gives you uh, a missingness frequency for each of the individuals. And that's something that we can use, and we can plot that. Um, so the next, I just want to show you the heterozygosity. So again, Plink allows us to calculate heterozygosity. Uh, we use a flag called minus minus het. Okay. Don't worry about the information here on the top. But essentially, also what we get out is we get some sort of if inbreeding coefficient C estimate, which is a, an S of heterozygosity in our samples. Okay. So what we then do is we plot our missingness together with our heterozygosity. So each of here, each dot represents an individual. Uh, uh, on the on the on the y on the y-axis we have heterozygosity rate. On the x-axis we have the proportion of missing genotypes. Okay, and what's plotted here on the uh, uh, horizontally uh, on the y-axis is the Plus minus three standard deviations from the mean of the overall heterozygosity rate. Okay, so these are the thresholds. These are the the, the borders. Over here, I think we're plotting uh, 0.6 uh, and 0.3. Uh, I think it's a little out of scale, but essentially, that what we're trying to do is put in the, the limits here. Um, so what we can do instead of just saying, okay, I'm going to take an arbitrary value of 0.5. And remove any individual that has a greater missingness than five percent. What we can actually do is we can use this graph to try and decide which is the best to use, where we retain an optimal number of our individuals. Okay. So from this, it looks like if we stick to uh, the heterozygosity rate of plus minus three standard deviations from the mean, we end up with a large chunk of our data, which is in here. Okay. Uh, and if we use a, a cutoff of, say, 6%, which is around here, right, removing any individuals with missingness of greater than 6%, we're losing these guys. But these, these guys definitely look like there's something going on, something wrong here, because they have excess missingness. And we're losing this chunk of individuals on the side over here, which I think is reasonable, because these are probably individuals where the gene typing hasn't gone that great. But we're still retaining a large proportion of our data there. Okay. So in our in our pipeline again, so we're not we're not going to run any plink, but we'll be able to put these these thresholds into our pipeline. So cut underscore min, which is actually our cut for missingness in individuals. Uh, we, uh, for example, here. Sorry, sorry, this is going to come out. Uh, one second. Uh, so for in this case, I'm saying. I want to remove uh, any individual uh, who is who, ha who ha doesn't have 98% of their uh, SNPs genotyped. 
Okay. Um, and then what I'm saying is the heterozygosity cutoff for at the high end is 0 0.343, and the heterozygosity cutoff at the low end is 0 0.15. So these two values, and I think this is going to be updated in the in the latest version of the pipeline, will actually be values that would be based on your data and will be plus minus three standard deviations from the mean of the heterozygosity in your data. Okay. But again, you can stipulate those parameters when you run when you run the pipeline. So these are the important things that you specify when you run the pipeline. Okay, so the next step that we want to uh, do is we want to identify if there are any related individuals, related or duplicate individuals in our data set. So one of the basic assumptions of some of the standard population-based association studies is that all our samples are unrelated. Okay. Uh, and this is because if you do have any relatedness in your data, uh, what happens is those can cause spurious signals that are false because those signals are actually, those regions uh, that are coming across as being associated with your phenotype are actually only coming across as being associated because you have over overrepresentation of a particular family or related individuals in your data set. Okay, um, and to identify, so there's a way to identify uh, whether individuals are related, obviously, based on genetic data or genotype data. So we're able to do this on an individual locus basis uh, by something called identity by state. Okay, so we can look at two individuals and see what alleles are they inheriting, uh, are they sharing between each other. And then if we look at that on a genome-wide scale, we can use something called identity by descent which is a measure overall across the entire genome of recent shared ancestry between two individuals. Okay. Um, the one thing to just notice here or to realize here is that when you're doing IBD calculations, uh, you need to have SNPs that are independent of each other. So what I mean by that is that you need to have removed any SNPs that are in LD with each other. Okay, so you need to have a set of SNPs where you are, that are independent from each other and are not in the LD with each other. Uh, and any, and you also need to remove any extended regions of LD. Okay. So well, how we can measure whether individuals are related to each other, we can calculate something called IBD. Okay. And in Plink, it's denoted as a value called pi hat. Okay. And pi hat, essentially, when we calculate that, we can say, OK, well, how related are two individuals to each other? So what Plink does is it runs this pairwise comparison uh, across your entire data set. And it says, what is the pi hat between two individuals? Okay, And if we have a pi hat of approximately 1, around 1, okay, that essentially means that we have either duplicate sample or we have monozygotic twins. Okay. Those are like completely two identical individuals in our data set based on the genotypes. Uh, if we have a pi hat of around 0.5, uh, those are essentially first degree relatives, pi hats of 0.25 second degree relatives, and pi hat of 0 0.1 to 5 third degree relatives. Okay. So this is a way that we can easily assess in our data set which individuals are related to each other and whether we do have related individuals uh, in our data set. Okay. And again, just quickly going through the, the, the Plink uh, commands. So remember I said that we need to have a, a, a data set where the SNPs are independent of each other and there's no LV. So the first step is we actually try to identify the set of independent SNPs with no LV. That's what this first step is doing. We then take the independent SNPs and we calculate pi hat. We calculate the pi hat value for all pairs of individuals in our data set. And in this case, I'm saying only give me the results where the pi hat is greater than 0 0.2. OK? Because I'm only really interested in those individuals where the relationship is more than, what is the one before? Uh, is around about second degree relative. OK? And then we get a result out. So we get a file. And it's going to have, for each pairwise comparison, it's going to give you what is the pi hat value uh, or the relationship between those individuals. And then based on that, you can then decide uh, what pi hat threshold you want to use. So obviously, your first one would be, 
I don't. I want to remove anyone who has. I want to remove one individual from a pair that has a pi hat of 0.8 or greater, because that's likely to be uh, either an identical individual. In most most instances, it's identical, or it's just a duplicate sample that was put in. Okay. So in most instances, the first thing you want to do is remove. If you have a pair with a pi hat value of greater than 0.8, you'd say remove one of those individuals. Okay. And then you can be, depending on the type of study that you're doing, you can say, what is the threshold that you're going to use for pi hat? So are you going to allow a, a, a relatively, uh, to what extent of relatedness are you going to allow there to exist in your data? And the, the, the thing now is that uh, in, 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 in sort of the earlier, earlier association studies, we didn't have a lot of uh, sophisticated techniques in order to account for relatedness. Whereas now we do have things like uh, linear mixed models, which allows you to incorporate relatedness into, uh, to, to account for relatedness into your data set, so as not to affect your association signal that you get out in the end. So what happens now is generally people are quite lax with the pi hat value. So they will allow, you know, second degree cousins, use a cutoff of 0.2. Uh, and remove basically one of the pair. So if you have a pair with a pi value of 0.2 uh, or greater, you then randomly remove one of those individuals from that pair in your data set. Uh, what people also do now is they just leave them in. So you just you just remove anyone, uh, or individ one individual from a pair who had greater than 0.8, and then you'd leave them in because some of the techniques down the line where you do association studies actually allows you to test with uh, uh, assuming that there is relatedness in your data set. Uh, but I guess this will be covered a bit more uh, in, 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 the, in the association testing uh, in the association testing lecture. Okay. Um, okay, so in terms of in terms of uh, the, the, the pipeline, what are the parameters that you can select? So when you are doing this uh, test, you can select what is your pi hat threshold. Okay. So at what point do you want to remove a, a single individual from a pair where they have a pi hat value greater than whatever the value is? So in this case, the pi hat value is 0 0.11. Uh, and then the super pi hat value is what I was talking about before, is what value do you use to identify duplicate individuals? So in this case, we're saying, Anyone with a pi value of greater than 0.7, we think that they could be duplicates, so remove one of them in the pair where they are, where they are duplicates. OK. And OK, so, 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 so I'm not going to talk a lot about population structure or population substructure, because this is going to be spoken about in the next lecture, I think. But essentially, this is something to consider, and it does have an effect uh, where if you have population substructure in your data set, uh, because your sample come from different genetic backgrounds, different genetic ancestries, this can lead to spurious associations just due to the difference in ancestry rather than association with your disease. So it is imperative to check for population structure within your samples. And if you do have structure in your samples, again, the type of association test that you do down the line can incorporate that population structure into the association test so it doesn't lead to spurious results. But one thing that we can do in, in our pipeline especially is that we want to know, for instance, we're doing a case control study, and we want to know are our cases similar to our controls, okay? Or are they very different? Because essentially you don't want to have, if you have cases and controls, you don't want to have cases from one genetic background and controls from a different genetic background because that's going to skew your results quite quite badly. So what we can also do in the pipeline is we can generate a PCA. Uh, so example, this is a PCA of cases and controls. And basically what you want to see or what you expect to see if your population is, if your controls and cases have been collected from the same population, you actually want to see a, a cluster where all of them are kind of together. This is quite scattered because it's zoomed in. You can see the scale is quite big, uh, 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 quite small on the axes. And from this also, you might be able to identify particular outliers. Uh, for example, where I put the Xs, 
these outliers might be individuals that you might want to remove because they seem to be, you know, have a very different uh, genetic background to the rest of your samples. So this is also something that you can do in, in the pipeline. So in, in your pipeline, when you run it, you, have, you will have another file which describes your samples. And in this case, this file I'm referring to is called sample.feed. Okay. And this is a parameter where you're saying, my case control information can be found in the file called sample.feed. My case control information can be found in that file in the column called feed. Okay, and that's where you would say uh, whether, your, whether your sample is a case of control. And that information is then used to actually generate the, to generate the PCA plot. Okay. Uh, we can also look at batches. So remember I said before that you know, running GWAS uh, samples in separate batches can cause batch effects. So you can also tell the pipeline that a particular set of samples was run in batch 1, a particular set of samples was run in batch 2, and a particular set of samples was run in batch 3. Um, so what you could generate that PCA again, uh, and it will then color it based on batch 1, batch 2, batch 3. And what you again expect is that you shouldn't have two, you shouldn't have your clusters separating too much from each other, because if your batches were run in exactly the same way, uh, well, not exactly the same way, but as closely as consistently as possible, uh, and if you do have differences in your batches, that might mean that there was something going on when you actually ran your samples that led to differences in your samples based on the, the different when the different batches were run. Um, okay, and again, so there's this, this file called batch uh, called sample .fee, and in that file you would have a column that is referring to which batch your samples are from. Okay, so. Uh, essentially, this is now a summary of what we've done. So what we did is we started off with looking at individuals that failed based on discordant sex. Uh, we create a file with those samples in it. We then looked at missingness and heterozygosity. We created a file with those samples in it, duplicate and related. Again, uh, divergent ancestry, if we looked at that, we would create a file. And then essentially what we do is we say, OK, I now want to create a new file. I want to remove all these individuals that failed, and I want to create a new Plink data set to move on to the next step. And essentially, this is how you would do it. But like I said, the, the, the Plink commands are there for you to look at, and you're not going to be doing this in the practical, but this is the way that you would do it in Plink. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause here before I go into the SNP QC, and I'm going to try and answer some of the questions, because I see there are some questions that have come up. Um, Okay, so Kalapo is saying, can we use isorelate or any other tool for IBD calculations? So I'm not sure, I'm not familiar with isorelate, but any 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 tool that calculates, you know, some sort of version of IBD or any sort of kingship matrix based uh, tool, is fine to use, and you could use that and identify your individuals who are related in the same way. It just makes it easier that if you are using Plink for everything else to run your IBD calculation in Plink. Okay, so Oscar says in studies where sample collection was in families is pi at four point four. Okay, so so again, so 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 what, the, what I was talking about were was not any sort of family-based study. So in a family-based study, a lot of the analysis that you do is very different. So your QC is very different actually, and actually your downstream tests are very different. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I, I, no, I, I don't know, I haven't done any family-based studies. Uh, and I'm assuming that you wouldn't actually, you, depending on the question that you're asking, you wouldn't actually exclude based on pie hats because you want to actually keep, you want to use the information from the families to infer your association. Um, but I, I'm, like I said, I'm not 100% I'm not correct on that. So, uh, so Oscar, no, I don't know exactly what pie hat value you would use. Um, Uh, Wisdom's asking, are the classing plots for the genotypes A, A, B done for each SNP position? Yes, so Wisdom, so the plot that I showed you, so the example I showed you with, okay, let me just go back to it quickly, because uh, this does confuse some people. Um, uh, 
So this, so this particular plot here, hopefully everyone can see it. It might take some time. So this is for every individual SNP. This particular plot is generated. Okay. So remember, in Genome Studio, that is what you get out. You get out. You get out a plot where we, where they were, where the software was able to call a genotype based on the intensities. Okay. So for every single SNP in your data set, you would have you would have a plot like this. Every single dot in this plot is an individual. Okay, so hopefully, hopefully that answers the question. Um, so my Zoom is having some problems with the internet. Hopefully you'll be able to watch the video and it'll be clear on there. So also said, in PC, an outlier depends on the level of zoom in. Yes, is there a guideline on what is an outlier? So, so we've had we've had lots of discussions about this, Oscar, and what we uh, so it, it it is a bit it is a bit subjective, and like and I agree with you 100 percent. It's based on on the, on 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 your PCs uh, and the scale of your PCs. Um, so what what we actually we've got a we've got a little so Scott actually written a little tool that tries to find the cent center of a center of a cluster, and then you can adjust based on how far out you want to go. Uh, in order to identify outliers, and we found it works. It works relatively well. So rather than just picking picking outliers visually, uh, we actually use this tool. So it tries to identify a central point of the cluster, and then you can and you can then say how many standard deviations outside of that uh, central point you want to go in order to identify outliers. So I can I can get back to you with that script, and 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 hopefully that'll be useful to you. So Abraham's got a question about batch effects. Um, so 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 one one way is, for example, if you you sample so you sampling the same population, right, and you're genotyping the same SNPs. If you if you generate a PCA, right, so, and, and 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 so 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 this is different. So if you do, if you're doing it for for cases and controls, you want them always to be you want them to be in the same genetic background, but they might be slightly different. If you're looking at a quantitative trait. Uh, you expect them to all be on the same background, come from the same genetic background. Not always the case, but that's what you expect. So if you run a PCA and you see a single cluster, then you know if you if you if you so, so, sorry, let me just start again. So for batch effects, what you would do is then you would separate your samples based on batch, so batch one, batch two, batch three. So you'll label your samples batch one, batch two, batch three. You have three different colors. You run a PCA. If those if those three different batches form one cluster, you're kind of happy more or less that that they've been genotyped the same way and they've got similar results. There isn't anything too majorly different between those batches. That's one way that you were trying to to detect whether there was a, a batch effect. Um, I don't spend too much of time on that because well, I'll come back to it, but I can actually speak to to Abram about it offline. So I'll chat to him about that. Um, Mamadou Pai hat would not enable to remove related individuals. Is only for removing duplicate. No, that's not correct. Um, so duplicate individuals. So Pi hat, if of your Pi hat is close to one point eight to one or point seven five to one, that would help you remove duplicate individuals. But because of these those other values, so as I said, remember I said. You know, pi out of 0.5 is first degree relatives. You know, you can use that to then say, okay, well, based on what, how close related you want your individuals to be in your dataset, that makes sense with your analysis. You can say, I want to remove any individual, any individual where there's a pair that has a pi hat value of 0.5, because I know that those are probably and most likely first degree relatives, or second degree, first degree relatives. So the pi hat value can be used to help remove not only duplicates, but be able to remove individuals that are at certain level of relatedness to each other. Wisdom, hopefully that answers Mamadou. Uh, what are the labels values used on the axis of the PCA plots? So the PCA plots are the eigenvalues. Um, and depending what software you're using to plot them, they scale differently. So it's actually the it's actually the eigenvalues that are output from the PCA analysis itself. 
that is used. So, uh, and then the, the position of the dot is a coordinate position based on the x and y axis. So that actually comes out. So if you're using Smart PCA to do your analysis, that is actually all contained in the in your Smart PCA eigenval and eigenvec file that comes out at the end. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail on that, but maybe it's something that we can we can come back to. Uh, we can come back to, uh, and hope wisdom is coming to the practical workshop. <laughs> so we can come back to that. Uh, what is the difference between inbreeding coefficient f and IBD pi hat? Uh, so in a way, in a way, the level of heterozygosity, uh, uh, you know, yeah. So in a way, that you know, the extent of heterozygosity can be related back to relatedness between individuals. Uh, I'm not sure of the direct correlation between between them, but I just know that they can both be used to assess whether individuals whether whether individuals are related. Off the top of my head, I know that that the inbreeding coefficient f is used at a population level. Uh, it's kind of used more at a population level than 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 using IBD and Pi hat. Uh, but I can't say more than that, Chidulis. Okay, so I think I think we should just go on quickly. I see we we've answered a couple of questions and I've still got we've still got to go through the the Q snip QC. Okay. Um, so just one thing before I, before I continue again. So 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 just for the for for the guys that are coming to the to the to the to the practical workshop, uh, please make sure that you. I hope you guys have managed to install uh, the pipelines and got it working. But please make sure that you you understand these next flow parameters. So they this would these parameters will be found in the next flow the config file. And that is where you would specify these parameters, and these would control how you actually run your 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 QC pipeline, and what parameters are used to select individuals and stuff that fail and pass. Okay, so let's move on now to snip QC. Uh, so again, just like the sample QC, we've got a number of different steps that we go through in order to interrogate our SNPs and find SNPs that are likely to be behaving badly and likely to be errors in our data rather than real SNPs that we can have high confidence in. So the first the first, the, the first uh, criteria that we look at is low minor allele frequency SNPs. So essentially this is uh, related directly to sample size. So and and the technology. So with genotyping genotype calling algorithms, it is very difficult to call uh, a SNP uh, that has a low minor allele frequency with a low sample size. So for example, here on the on the left hand side plot, you'll see that the this particular SNP has a very low minor allele frequency for the blue allele, whatever the homozygous homozygous uh, allele that's blue. Um, so in most instances. Uh, it actually the genotype calling algorithm would actually not be able to call these SNPs accurately. So where you have a SNP that has a very low minor allele frequency, chances are that that SNP is not going to be called properly and it's not going to be called correctly in your data. Okay. So obviously, if you have a very high number of individuals, you can try and this can be improved. But in most instances, we try to avoid using SNPs uh, or we try to. Okay, does anyone can't see the slide? I see Mamadou says, can't see the slide. Everyone else can see the slide? Low minor allele frequency SNPs. Okay. Okay, Mamadou, I think it's something on your side. Um, so essentially what we do is we, we try not to, we know that minor allele frequency SNPs are, are, are problematic. And steps with low minor allele frequencies are problematic. So essentially, what we do is we choose a threshold, and we just cut off. We don't assess any SNPs that uh, have a minor allele frequency of less than one percent or five percent, etc. Okay. Um, and and also in most instances, if you're looking if you're looking at complex complex diseases, uh, you know, 
chances are that a lot of the, the, the SNPs that are contributing to that, we do have rare occasions where, you know, it's a rare SNP that has a large effect size. But in most instances, a lot of our SNPs are actually common and having small effect sizes. So again, this is how you did in Blink. So we have a way in which we can calculate minor little frequency. So we say Plink minus minus, sorry, I'm wiping this out. Plink minus minus B file. Uh, oh, in the example, we use the flag minus minus freak. Okay, and that is essentially what that does is it calculates a minor little frequency for all our SNPs in our data set. This is the file that you get out. So this is chromosome one, uh, that's the SNP. Those are the two alleles and calculates the minor little frequency. And what we can do then is we can generate a plot. We can plot out what is the distribution of our minor real frequencies. And based on the plot, we can decide what our cutoff is, okay, how much of, how many SNPs do we want to actually lose? Or we can just say, okay, well, I'm happy to choose a minor real frequency of 1%, and anything less than 1%, I will, I will uh, remove from my data, okay? So any SNP with a minor real frequency of less than 1%, I will remove from my data set, okay? That's pretty straightforward. And again, in, 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 in the pipeline, the parameter, the threshold, so the threshold that we decide on, cut underscore minus math, in this case, it's 1%. So I'm saying I, will remo I want to remove any SNPs uh, that have a minor real frequency of less than 1%, or 1% or less. Okay. So the next step is we want to now identify SNPs with high missingness. Okay. So again, remember I said that we calculated this in the beginning when we use the minus we use the minus missing flag, okay? Okay, and we had a file that was actually per SNP missingness, okay? So this is for each SNP. It's going to tell you so the <clears throat> the number of genotype, the number of missing, and it's going to give you a frequency value, okay? So the frequency of missingness for a particular SNP, okay? And we can use this again to generate a plot, okay? And in this case, I'm plotting the missingness frequency uh, against the fraction of SNPs in my data set. So again, we can either choose the thresholds that we decide on. We can say, okay, well, I'm going to remove any SNP that has a missingness of greater than 1% or greater than 2% or greater than 5%. Uh, or we can, like this, the, these plots are quite useful because it says, okay, if I choose a missingness of 0.2% or 0.2, which is 2%, you know, I'm still keeping, what fraction of my SNPs am I still keeping? So I'm still keeping around 90% of my SNPs, right? I'm losing this bit, and I'm still keeping around 90% of my SNPs. So this, these, these plots are sort of good, a good way to, to sort of find a balance between excluding too many SNPs, because it, it might have been, you know, if you just said, oh, I'm going to remove any SNP that has a missingness of greater than 3%, and you end up losing, you know, 20% of your data, uh, it might be that you need to play around with it. You might have bad data, but you might need to play around with it a bit more and choose a, le a more lenient cutoff in order to have a larger data set to work with, okay? So that's where these plots come in handy in order to assess how much of data you're going to lose if you choose a particular particular, particular threshold uh, for missingness. And so when we're looking at missingness now, uh, this is the parameter. So cut, sorry, uh, cut underscore Gino is our parameters for, for, for per SNP missingness. So for in this case, I'm saying it's 0 0.01. So I'm saying that I want to remove any SNPs that have a, great, a missingness of greater than 1%. Okay. Okay, the next step is differential missingness. So up to now, I haven't really differentiated between doing QC for case control versus doing QC for quantitative traits. Uh, in most instances, a lot of it is the same. Uh, this particular this particular step is only where you're looking at cases and controls. So this is essentially saying, uh, are there any SNPs where there's a significant difference between the missingness between my cases and controls because if that is the case, it can it can skew your association result. Um, and essentially, what we do is we look at missingness frequency separately in the cases and controls, 
And then we try and identify any SNPs that could be highly differentially, uh, show high differences in missingness between our cases of control, and we have a p-value uh, based on that, and we can exclude those particular SNPs. Uh, again, Plink allows us to do that. Um, so the flag that we use here is test missing. Okay, and what it does is it looks at all the SNPs. It looks at the, the frequency of missingness in your affected, so your cases, your unaffected, your controls, and it works out a p-value to see if there is any significant difference between missingness between your cases and controls. It then generates a plot of that p-value. In most instances, the plot isn't too informative, and we usually just use a threshold of, uh, you know, zero. What's this? 0 0.00001 uh, for the p-value to indicate if there are, is any different differential missingness between uh, a particular SNP in our cases and controls. So this is something that you would then only employ, obviously, if you have uh, if you're looking at cases and controls. You're not doing a quantitative. Or you're not looking at a, a quantitative uh, phenotype. Okay. And again, within the pipeline, we have a, 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 a uh, this is the threshold that it uses, cut diff miss. And this now, this now is quite a, this is quite a stringent threshold. Uh, but again, this is what you can adjust when you are running your pipeline. You select these particular parameters. And those are the thresholds that are used when you actually are removing steps and uh, samples during the QC. Okay. Okay. The next one is Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. Um, so, essentially, so, so essentially, what Hardy Weinberg equilibrium is, is that under certain circumstances, or certain assumptions, we expect that allele frequencies and genotype frequencies remain uh, that there's some relationship and that uh, they remain constant over over many generations. And that if we do, if, if there is a deviation from Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, that there's something interesting happening uh, happening with that SNP. Uh, but in this case, what are we using Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium for? We're using it actually as a proxy to say, OK, well, if a particular SNP is not acting as it should uh, or not acting as the way that we expect in terms of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, it's possible that that SNP could actually be a genotyping error. OK? So it's a bit, it's a bit difficult to think about it because in essence, we may also have SNPs that are out of, out of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium that might actually be related to disease, because it, it might be that, that that SNP is under some sort of pressure that is actually it's it, it's actually gone through a process where it is out of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Okay, but in this case, we we try to use this Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium test as a very very simple proxy to identify genotyping errors. Okay. So what we can do is we can calculate whether a particular SNP is in Hardy-Weinberg Hardy -Weinberg equilibrium or not. And we base that on the allele frequencies and the genotype counts. And we essentially run a chi-square test. So we say, and the null of that chi-square test is that that SNP is, is the null is that it is, it is in linkage disequilibrium. Linkage, it is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, sorry. Nothing to do with linkage. It is, it is in the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Uh, and we run this test, and we can we can determine whether a particular SNP is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium or not. Okay, and if it isn't, it could be also related to other things. So the one thing that we think it could be related to is genotyping error. Okay, and that's why we use this Hardy-Weinberg test. It could also be related to, related to things like subdivided populations. Uh, we could have had excess homozygotes, which is related to the experiment. Allele, we could have an allele dropout in, in samples, or DNA samples that are quite old. And also any other Hardy-Weinberg violations of the Hardy-Weinberg assumptions. So this test is not, is not ideal, but it is a good proxy to try and identify SNPs that are probably genotyped quite badly. Um, so essentially what we do is we, we exclude SNPs if there's substantially more or fewer samples heterozygous at a SNP, so, it doesn't, so it's not in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And essentially, what we use is we try to use a very, a very lenient threshold here. So we use a p-value of 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 6. Okay. In most instances, in most studies now, they use a p-value of 10 to the minus 6. Uh, and we 
kind of only do this in the controls, right? Because we know that there could be SNPs in our cases uh, where where they might be out of Hardy Weinberg equilibrium because they might be linked to the disease. Okay. Um, so so if you have a case control study, you generally do this in the in the controls uh, and then try to see if that SNP is if 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 a particular SNP comes out as as being deviating from Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. And then, if you are doing a quantitative study, you did just basically use a, a somewhat lenient threshold, like 10 to the minus 6, to identify SNPs that are deviating from Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. Okay. And again, Plink allows you to do that, so we can calculate the we can calculate the p-values for Hardy Weinberg equilibrium using uh, the flag called minus minus Hardy. And then what we can do is uh, we can select it. We can do some some uh, file manipulation to extract only our current controls, and then we can plot those p-values only in our controls. And again, we can either use the plot to determine uh, what our what our p-value is, or we can just use the p-value threshold of 10 to the minus 6. What you'll see in a lot of studies now is that the p-value of 10 to the minus 5 or 10 to the minus 6 is used. Just so that just so that you don't remove possible interesting SNPs uh, by using a p-value that's too stringent, okay? Because again, now because we're using Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium as a proxy to identify SNPs that might have been genotyped badly, okay? But Hardy-Weinberg is li linked to biology and could be linked to uh, an association. Uh, it could be linked to differences in SNP allele frequencies related to the disease. So you don't actually want to remove, you don't actually want to be too stringent on that. And again, in our pipeline, the the parameter or the threshold that we use is cut underscore Hardy or HWE. And then this is the parameter that you can set. So this is the p-value threshold that you can set for identifying SNPs that deviate from Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Okay. So again, at the end of that, uh, at the end of that process, then you create a, a new clean data set, removing all, all the SNPs that you've identified as pos pro probably being problematic, and then also using the thresholds that you selected. So, for example, here, uh, oh, sorry, um, for example, here, sorry, uh, in this instance, we're saying I want a, a minor real frequency of 0 0.01, so I want to remove any SNPs uh, that have a minor frequency of 1% or less. Uh, I want to remove any SNPs that uh, have uh, a missingness of greater than 5%. Uh, I want to exclude uh, all the SNPs that failed uh, the, the dif uh, differential missingness test between cases and controls. Uh, I want to exclude all uh, SNPs that were found to be out of Howard E. Weinberg equilibrium at a p-value of 10 to the minus 1 to 10 to the minus 5. And then I want to create a new a new data set at the end of that. OK. Uh, then the final steps, uh, in most cases, when you're doing an association study, you wouldn't uh, be doing the association study on X and Y chromosome. So you can uh, Plink allows you to remove uh, the X and Y chromosome and then have a final data set which is just the autosomes. We obviously don't do this in the beginning because we use we use the X chromosome data in the in the sex check. Okay, so like I said, uh, hopefully that's that's given you an, a good insight into the workings of how we run QC. Just one thing to keep in mind again to reiterate that the order that I've spoken to you about in the lecture is not is not always the best order to do it. We've optimized that order. We've tried to optimize as best as possible the order in which to do the QC in the pipeline. And this is actually an overview of the pipeline. So what you should, everything on here should be familiar to you now. So you see we have input files. We have identify and remove duplicate SNPs, uh, in, identify uh, individuals with discordant sex information. Uh, so all this now should make sense to you because I've given, I've actually gone through each one of these steps and describe to you how we actually do it in Plink. On the right-hand side here, there's the other plots. So all the, some of the plots that I showed you in, in, the, in the lecture and some additional plots that will be generated. 
And once you run the pipeline, everything gets done, and at the end, what you end up with is you end up with a, a report. So it's a PDF, and essentially in the PDF, you would have the results of each one of these tests. Okay, so just some advice in terms of how to go about doing this. So like, like you saw, there the, 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 the are thresholds that we need to select, uh, and we need to base these thresholds on sometimes base it on the plots that we're generating, sometimes just base it on what people have used before. So essentially, what you would do with the, the QC pipeline is, based on your data, you would then look at the, the thresholds that have been set up. You might choose to keep all the default thresholds, run through your QC, generate your report, then assess your report. Go through your report and say, OK, what does this make sense to me? How many snips am I losing? How many samples am I losing? Am I being too stringent on this parameter? Am I being, am I not being stringent enough on this parameter? And then go back to your, to your, to your parameter file, change your thresholds based on that, run it again. And it is an iterative process. So you want to try and optimize, you know, if you, if you run QC the first time, you end up losing 50% of your data. You know, that's not ideal. And then you're going to have to be, start being a bit more creative about how you run your, how you're running your QC. Uh, but that's just some advice on, 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 on how to go about running running the QC. And with that, I'm going to end. Uh, just some acknowledge acknowledgments. Obviously, the funding from NIH and HA Barnett. And then Ananyo, so, so the slide set that I'm using is, is a combination of my slides and slides that we've been using to teach QC over the last couple of years. So he's, he's responsible for generating some of those slides. So thank you, everyone. I hope it's been useful. And I'll take, I think we've got some time for questions. And uh, I'll take questions. Uh, so let's see what the time is. OK, so let's, let's just tackle the questions quickly here. Uh, OK. OK, so the first question from CBSB, I might have answered already. Uh, is there a recommendation of the order of applying these filters? So like I said, uh, different orders would generate different results. So like. Like some of, you would, might, some of you might have picked up the first the first step that you should actually do is look at snip missingness before you look at anything else because that's going to have a big a big determination on downstream results. So there are some suggested orders. Uh, the problem with writing a pipeline uh, is that the way that we wrote the next pipeline is that it was it was quite difficult to incorporate selecting in which order things were done. So that is actually not an option in the pipeline. So we've tried to do it in the best way possible, but in all honesty, that might not be the best way for every single data set. But we hope that it's close enough. Uh, Manzin, I have to for the I did the analysis with less of the Less than ten percent of what? Ten percent of your samples, or ten percent of your SNPs. Samples. Okay, so you say samples. I, I, I would, I would question that because if it's less than ten percent, that means that something very strange happened with your experiment. Uh, and also, less than ten percent is a very small sample size. So I would not, I would not go with that. I would try to see. I would try to explore more why you are losing a lot of your samples and try to see if that could maybe be resolved. It could be something that you did in your in your sampling or some mix up, but I wouldn't trust results on ten percent of three hundred and forty three samples with a to get an accurate association. Okay, wisdom, which files do you use for SNP QC? Okay, so so for SNP QC, so so both for both SNP and sample QC here, we're we using Plink. So we're using binary Plink format files. And generally from generally if you can go from the genotyping report to 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 I didn't show you, but there's a there's a the file format before binary plink, which is called pet and map. You can generally go from the genotype report files to a pet and map file, and then from a pet and map file to a bind to your 
your FAM, your BED, your BIM file uh, directly within Plink. So for all that I've showed you here, we're working on your BED, BIM, and FAM file. Uh, so the lecture will be shared. You should get a link to it and the and the recording. Yeah, so everyone should get a link. If you receive the email today for this lecture, you'll get a link to the lecture and the recording on YouTube. Julius has a question. Before running next flow, does one have to run through Plink to determine the issues? So, so no, Julius. So, 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 so what I was saying at the end was essentially what you what you do is you can choose to run the pipeline with the default thresholds and get a result out, and then from there assess uh, what your there from there assess uh, what thresholds you need to change. The pipeline does run relatively quickly, so from a time point of view. Uh, it's not too bad to run run through the whole thing once at least once. Get get the results out, get the the graphs out, and then based on those, then decide, uh, then start tuning your parameters, particularly for your data set, your thresholds, particularly for your data set. Oh, so Mazin said, sorry, 10% minor your frequency. <laughs> so did you remove, so, yeah, so did you remove anything with greater than, that? you removed any snips with less than 10% minor your frequency? Okay. So. Uh, maybe we'll come back to that. Oscar, I find some of the colors appear subjective. Is this true? Do you know the colors may be awful? Yeah, so Oscar, this has been this has been an issue for 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 a long time with GWAS, um, and 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 uh, there is a reference. I'll try and I'll try and put the reference in, which is uh, actually it is a psychiatry in a psychiatry journal, looking at at the parameters, and it is subjective and it is data dependent. So yeah, I would agree with you 100%. And I, the, there aren't any Hard and fast references on some of some of the parameters, uh, but yeah, I'll try. I'll try and get that reference up for you. It's it's got some good suggestions uh, on on that. Okay, if there are no other questions, I'd just like to say thank you very much, Sean, for that uh, really excellent lecture. Great. Um, Any other I think questions? everyone also agrees with the crowd that that was a brilliant lecture. So thank you very much, and thank you to the attendees. I'll close the meeting room. Please co uh, complete the attendance survey, and see you on Monday's lecture. Thanks.